why it is you're failing in your machine learning initiatives, whether that's predictive analytics or whether that's predictive forecasting, take zero. All right, so we just finished um, doing our three-day UNS workshop uh, at IIoT.University. First off, the response to the workshop was incredible. Uh, it was actually a very hard, it was the hardest workshop I've ever had to do in terms of putting it on. Day one, you know, we had something like 400 and something students. I think there were 183 of them live, the most we've ever had. Um, there were 100 students who were, this was literally their first workshop they'd ever done with us at IOT.University. So the vast majority were already members of Mastermind, but 100 of them were brand new. So they had never seen any of the foundational elements, the standard presentations where we talk about why do manufacturers even care about digital, you know, do the manufacturing holy grail, what are the steps to digital transformation, the different types of architectures that people use, the ones that work, the ones that don't. Yeah, there were 100 students who had never even seen that stuff. So the way we broke out the UNS workshop real quickly was on day one, we did a non-manufacturing example so there was foundational elements in the first couple of hours. And then, uh, and then we, I did a, a live step-by-step -step workshop where all the students were building, turning themselves into a digital node using Python. Um, and then we all published into a common infrastructure. And then actually in the third step of the development, they were consuming information from other operators, other digital nodes. So. We had 180 something students. I think uh, about a hundred of them were, were developing live with me. And then the first thing that they did was they turned themselves into a digital node using Python, structuring a descriptive namespace. So basically uh, a namespace that gives um, definitional information about who they are, who they are, where they're located, semantic hierarchy. They publish their node into the broker and everybody can see each other, okay? Then the second one, we did a functional namespace where we built a function that gave, gave us the ability to monitor our activity as a node. So basically we just wrote a, a script that did, was able to track mouse movement. So I am an active node. I'm, connect, I'm either connected or, and or active. And we built the function that did, that showed active, okay? And then in the step three of the first lesson of the first day, then what we did was we actually built an informative, an informative namespace that basically displayed to us um, the total number of connected digital nodes, people, and the total number who were currently active. That is the ones who were actively working. And it was a way of illustrating what unified namespace actually is with semantic hierarchy, descriptions, functions, and um, informative namespaces. Day two, we did the um, we did the first part of our build where we actually took our virtual factory and we built descriptive, functional, and informative name an informative namespace for our virtual factory, which was based on a flexible packager. And then day three, I did an integration into Google Cloud. A couple of things that came up that are are bigger answers. They are bigger answers to the community. Was I got a lot of questions about not understanding. One of the values of unified namespace is that if my goal as a manufacturer is to achieve the manufacturing holy glare, well, so not only do I, does everyone know current state of my business, but we're able to predict future state. We're able to predict problems like issues with a recipe, it should be issues with delivery, issues with downtime in the future, uh, accurate forecasting of what our production will be in the future. Um, suggestions on how we can optimize our schedules. If we want to achieve that, okay, we ultimately have to build a digital infrastructure upon which models can learn from. That's what machine learning is, okay? Machine learning is computers learning from data, okay? In order for us to be able to do that, there are two really important elements of data in order to be able to do prediction, and that's called contextualization and normalization. So in order for me to find relationships between data points, the, many of you will hear the term linear regression. Linear regression is the simplest of all the machine learning models. It's basically, I wanna take a bunch of data, throw it together, 
I want to write a model that will predict for every value X, for every value of X, I want to know what the likely outcome Y is. Okay, that and then and what the level of confidence is. So for every value X, I want to be 95 to 99 percent confident that I can predict what the outcome Y is from the value X. So in order for me to be able to do that, there's a real two really important concepts that lead into why it is manufacturers fail when they try to predict the future. And that's the contextualization and normalization of data. Okay, in order for me to have a relationship between X and Y, I have to have context. I have to put that data and store that data within context of the relationship of X and Y. So a really simple way of doing that is if I have a, if I have a, 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 a sensor and that sensor is a temperature sensor that changes 60 times per second and and there's and I want to find the relationship between a temperature sensor and the failure on a drive the first thing I have to do is put the state of the drive and that temperature sensor in context so that they can be for a lack of a better term queried in relate in relation to one another okay that's data context okay there's lots of other things about context lots of other things about context engineering units scaling all that kind of stuff but in the, in the terms of being able to predict the future, the contextualization of data that we really care about is that the data points are being stored and retrieved in context of one another. The second concept that's really important, and, and, and unified namespace makes that native to the architecture. So in the beginning, when you are first starting out in your digital transformation initiative, and you're, and you're, and you're an ignorant organization, you don't know what you don't know, okay? You don't know why it is that you need to have an architecture that puts data in context natively. I don't, I don't have to ask an engineer to contextualize it. I don't have to ask a data scientist to contextualize it. I need to create a digital infrastructure upon which it is contextualized. You know that at some point in the future you want to predict, but you don't know how important contextualization is to prediction. So when you go and hire some company to bring a bunch of data scientists in what, to do some predictions, what's the first thing they got to do? A, they got to find out what data is available. Then they have to find out where that data is. Then they have to put that data in context. And the last piece is they have to normalize it. Remember that sensor I told you about? The, the sensor that changes 60 times every second, the temperature sensor, and we want to find a relationship between that and a state code that comes out of the, out of the variable frequency drive? Well, guess what? I may have that the, the state that I'm looking for, the failure that I might be looking for, might be a code that symbolizes a thermal overload in the drive. It might be a register in that drive that signifies a thermal overload. That is the drive tripped on thermal. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to predict that it's going to trip on thermal long before it ever gets to the point where it trips. Well, if that in order for me to do that, I have to normalize the, the measurement of the ambient temperature with the failure over time. And I have to model that over time. And I'm looking for a pattern that will signify this, this negative outcome, which is a drive tripping on thermal overload. Okay, the first thing I have to do is I, I may have a, a trip, a code of night, let's say that the status register in the drive that says thermal overload is the register of the tag equals 99. You might get the value of 99 on a drive one time every six months for 10 seconds before it gets reset. So what I've got is a value of 99 for 10 seconds once every six months. And if all I wanna do is model the relationship between ambient temperature and that negative outcome of 99, the first thing I have to do is collect all the transitions of the temperature sensor at 60 hertz, that would be 60 times per second, times every second, times every hour, times every day, times every week, times every month, all those changes in temperature. And I have to have, I have, to have a value of that status register. So I have to have a one-to-one -one relationship. That's normalization of data. It is amazing to me. The number of people who ask the question, I don't understand 
why context and normalization of data matters. In the workshop, there were a lot of people, and there were a lot of people who understood. There were tons and tons of students going, people would ask the question, well, why does that need to be there? And students would go, well, for context and normalization, they were writing it in the chat. But the number of people who didn't understand context and normalization, and you wonder why people are failing in their machine learning initiatives. Like if you're an executive and you're going out there and you're saying, well, hey, we want to use this data shit, this big data stuff to predict problems. And then you're wondering why you can't predict. You're spending millions of dollars or you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on these pilot projects where you're bringing data scientists in to go and find where the data is and then contextualize it and normalize it for one fucking use case. One use case. The, your problem is that the underlying architecture in your business does not support what it is they're trying to do. That's what you know, that's what just one element of what the architecture, what a UNS architecture gives people. If you want to know why it is I was able to build a company in 10 years, I was able to build an integrator that went from operating in a garage, an office, an office next to my garage in my fucking house with just me as the employee, to three months later, eight employees, to 10 years later, at scale, the most famous integrator on the planet, the, you know, working with the companies that everyone wants to work with, unified namespace, and our values are the fucking reason. What was happening was, is we were using unified namespace as an architecture to solve a problem the customer knew they had, but laying the foundation for our ability to solve problems in the future they didn't know they had. That's what UNS is. And if you want to know why it is that you are not, you're not able to, you're writing a check to try to, to some vendor to try and solve a problem for you, predict the future, predict failure or predict success, and they're either struggling to do it or they're struggling to scale it after they did it, the architecture is the reason, all right? I strongly encourage you, if there's anything that came out of the UNS workshop for me, for the community, a couple things that I need to teach publicly to the community, right now this is one of them, and I'm gonna do it even in more detail in whiteboard videos, context and normalization. But the other thing is understanding the types of namespaces that we put in a UNS, in a unified namespace. Descriptive namespaces, functional namespaces, informative namespaces, and ad hoc namespaces. And then I also need to teach the red and blue concept of design. Um, that's probably Chinese to everybody I'm talking to right now, but the, it, it, except for those in the community. But I, I, I took, came out of that workshop thinking, okay, these are three things I definitely need to teach. And it, and it was invaluable to have that hundred or so students who had never taken a, a, a workshop with us to see what it is that the, I got a chance to see what it is the market in general is still missing. So going forward, our next workshop, we, for mastermind students and for a la carte students, we will be doing a, a workshop every single quarter going forward. So this was the Q3 workshop. The Q4 workshop for 2024 is recruiting and retaining the employee of the future. We're primarily gonna focus on end users here. It's a huge problem. They're having problems recruiting and re recruitment and retention of the employee of the future. And, and the technologist who knows how to unlock potential in data. Um, also how to reorg your business. What groups, what new group needs to be there? What job titles need to be there? How do you identify those people? We're gonna be doing a workshop for that in the fourth quarter. We're doing that in November of this year. I think it's November 6th and 7th. We will be doing UNS Advanced. We'll be doing an extension of this UNS workshop in March of next year, the first quarter of next year. And then we have a whole other series. We're gonna be doing a, um, we're gonna be doing one, one of the workshops we're gonna do next year is we're gonna do two or three days, I think it's gonna be three days, where we're gonna do the same use case, three different crowd, cloud providers. And I'm fairly certain we're gonna go um, AWS, Azure, and Google, Google Cloud. Um, but we'll have a list of the workshops that we're, we're planning for now. UNS workshop was an enormous hit. I, the response was just overwhelming. I couldn't, I was actually stunned at the number of people who took the workshop. Um, it was very humbling actually, but there were definitely things I learned from it. And if you wanna know the things that you should be studying, under, try to understand better, 
Number one, at, answer this question. Why do manufacturers care about digital? Okay, and the answer is they want to achieve the manufacturing holy grail. You need to, def you need to figure out what that is. Okay, number one, we, ha we have a definition for it. Number two, what are the different types of namespace types for unified namespace? Functional, descriptive, functional, and informative plus ad hoc. I will be releasing the formal definitions of that. And then um, last but not least, why does context and normalization of data matter? Why does context matter? Why does contextualization matter? What role does it play in predicting the future? Why does, why does normalization matter? The normalization of data matter. What is it and why does it matter? And what role does it play in predicting the future? All right, with that, like, subscribe, comment down below, and I'll see you in the next one.